Good morning, neighbors. How are you doing this beautiful morning? It's so wonderful to be able to share with you here today a, a brief time of, of devotion here today. And so wonderful to see many of you this past Sunday, 72 of you as a matter of fact. And, uh, and so it was a wonderful blessing to my wife and my family. It was wonderful to see the kids again. I know my wife and my daughter really appreciated all the children that came out. And you could just see the hunger and the celebration in people's eyes that we were able to worship together. And doing so safely, by the way. I mean, following every protocol possible to make sure that we don't pass this on and making sure that um, everybody stays well. Um, today, this morning, I got here uh, early. Uh, got letters to put over the entrances. So when you come to the church, you'll see that there are... All the entrances are lettered A through G, and so uh, it's a way to help people understand where the entrances are for the church. Uh, if they've never came here before, they know that entrances C and G are the ones that are behind the sanctuary. Uh, to my office is entrance A, and to the church office is entrance B, and to Towers Hall would be entrance E. And so there's all these wonderful ways to get people to uh, uh, more comfortable um, to come and gather together. So because if people are coming to a church for the first time and they see all of the, the massive parking area that we have, they don't know what is the right entrance for them to enter. And so um, that's one of the things that we have done. Um, also, you'll see that there are foot pulls now on the bottom of the doors that I have installed. So if you're uncomfortable with grabbing the handle you can pull the door open with your foot um, and I'm making adjustments to the tension on those things so you don't have to be a weight lifter to be able to open those doors but um, you know the message uh, that I have for all of you here today I, I shared with you on Sunday but uh, time didn't allow to go in depth on how much more I would have liked to have gone into that message. While it was still a powerful message moved by the Holy Spirit by a lot of different individuals that were there and encouraged, uh, encouraged by it, I want to go back to it. And so I'm going to have my cheaters with me here today. And so if you're uh, able to follow along, I'm going to open up uh, with Hebrews uh, chapter 10 and uh, we're going to pick up where we were on Sunday. And so if you want to follow along, I'm reading out of the NIV, my traditional Thompson's chain. And I'm going to start um, in verse 23 of chapter 10 of Hebrews. And so the author of Hebrews writes this. It says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he has promised what who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now the day is capitalized there for the specific reason of talking about when Jesus returns. Now this was 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus and amazingly already 20 years after the fact people were neglecting the gathering together. And so we must ask the question, well, what was the reason? Was there a cultural influence outside that was really affecting this? Um, possibly. I shared that on Sunday, that that is a possible thing. But I think if we really open our eyes to um, what is being said in Scripture uh, here as the author of Hebrews, we might pick up on some keys that a reason why the author wrote those words. First and foremost, if you go back in chapter 10 just a little bit and say we pick up to chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 11, and it says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Of course, that's speaking of Jesus. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to may, be made a footstool because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And so he's talking about that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
as being our God, being the atoning sacrifice for our sins, that is uh, transformative of itself. As I shared on Sunday, we talked about having the love of God, that unconditional love. And unconditional means there's no conditions attached to it, and that's that John 3.16 verse. For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, or inherit everlasting life. That is love. That's universal. That's over all people. Now, he might not love the things that we're doing, but the possibility for us to be saved is freely available to everyone who chooses to use and, and accept Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for their sins. Now, it doesn't stop there because as you grow in this idea of unconditional love, true holiness, because we can't be holy on our own, we can't just um, live on the laurels of what Jesus has done for us and live as if we have, are not changed. However, the process of holiness or the infilling of the Holy Spirit being guided by the Holy Spirit to make right and holy churches grows us. We cannot be holy of ourselves, but we can be holy by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that process is called what we used to call sanctification. True holiness is being filled by the Holy Spirit. And so as we continue along that thought, we understand that this one sacrifice was once and for all and trying to get everybody to understand. Now, where we're reading this morning, where I gave you started, is what's titled the, the perseverance part of chapter 10. And I want to point out to some things that may be going on in the... The, the, the church that the author is addressing at this time because there's a, a word that is used in the, the message that we are receiving today. It says, let us, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he has promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds. Now, spur is an interesting term because when we think of spur, imagine a cowboy that has a spur on the back of his boot, that he spurs his horse along, gives it a little bit of a nudge to go the direction that uh, they need to go. And so if they need to go a little faster, a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a tug, and that's spurring them. But the amazing thing is, is the term that's being used there, spur, can be used in a positive sense and can be used in a negative sense. In fact, the word that is, uh, that is used there, that's in the Greek that's being used there, is the word parakaleo. And parakaleo means that you entice or encourage or comfort someone towards love. When we think of the term spur, we get the, the term that oftentimes we use in our human condition the wrong way, and when we spur something the wrong direction, we get to the point where we say we're beating a dead horse. And what does that mean? Well, it means that in the, when people would ride horses that they would um, spur them so much and they would hit them so much and they would run and run and run. And if you're not careful with a horse, they'll literally run until they die. They won't stop before that. They'll literally run themselves to death and so the idea that, you know, you're trying to get that, it's dead on its feet. You can't make it go any faster. It's not, and it, it's dead. And the amazing thing is in our human condition, oftentimes we don't encourage one another uh, towards love, but we in, actually spur one another and we beat a dead horse because we, we don't allow their past to be the past and to encourage them to move towards love. And so if you look in the context of what the author of Hebrews is writing here, if you really pay attention closely, the reason why there's the neglecting of the gathering together, as some were already accustomed to doing, is because of the, the different spurrings that were going on within that congregation of people. And if you are getting spurred the wrong way, or if you're being judged or discouraged, the opposite of be encouraged is discouraged. And so when people start discouraging you or treating you poorly or they're beating a dead horse and they're not able to move on, you're spurring them not towards love, but you're spurring them away from Jesus, who is the, 
the one and only high priest, the ultimate sacrifice for all humanity, and none of us are perfect. And so it's what we're supposed to do is, is spur one another towards love and good deeds, not spurring each other to cause factions and divisions and groups and, and, and little cells that are going on, but unity together, understanding we've all missed the mark, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so when you see this, you see that humanity or people, they generally are people, and that idea that the word that is used there in, in, the, in the Greek parakaleo is used in a positive sense, meaning let's come alongside and spur them, encourage them towards work and love. But that has to start with us because we really need to understand that if we are to encourage them towards love, then we must love them irregardless and unconditionally so that we can spur them to the area that we're already at. And if we're not there ourselves, how can we spur them towards love and good works? We can do good things, but with the absence of love, they're fruitless deeds. And so we must understand that if we are truly to be God's church, that we are spurring one another towards love and good deeds, not discouraging them, not beating a dead horse, not spurring them away from the church, saying you're not worthy of the sacrifice of Jesus because that is not our call. There's only one that gets to make that call, and that's Jesus himself. And so he is the righteous judge. We are not. And so when it comes down to it, and all true spiritual holiness, we must learn to do the things in which Jesus told us so that we can obey the law. We must love God with everything that we are, and we must love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And it's those things that spur one another towards love. And if one of those things is, are lacking, then we can't be the positive influence. There's not the unity that is possible. There's unity there in small factions that cause disagreements and people butt heads, but it's not encouraging and seeing the good that is possible in all persons. And, and so that's what we really need to pay attention to when we look at this in Hebrews here today. Because there was the improper spurrings that were going on. And he's talking about, let's spur one another in hope and love. And that's what I shared on Sunday. Um, that we really need to become the, the church of God around the world. The church that Jesus died for, who's the cornerstone for. Need to be really the proper representation and living out the way that Jesus commanded us to live out. And that's really quite plain as you read Luke chapter 4 as he lays it out and he reads Isaiah 61 to his hometown and basically drops the mic and says, today this has been fulfilled, that we feed the poor, the hungry, the na clothe the naked. That is our responsibility and the idea of unconditional is a thing that we in our human understanding struggle with because we don't, we always put conditions around our love. We love you if we agree with you. We love you if you act like us or think like us or, you know, and that's what causes so much separation. That's what causes sec segregation. That's what causes sexism, not seeing the souls that are within all human beings, but only congregating with those that, we, that are like us, which is a detriment to the church. He desires one church, no matter whatever your sex is, whatever your race is, whatever your upbringing is, there is to be unity under the one and the same Jesus who died for everyone. And so many times we make our decisions because, well, they, they align with our democratic or republican upbringing or belief system. Um, or it, they, they follow along the way I believe and, and, and but really missing the mark of the way Jesus taught the gospel. And so, I pray that today that we would begin to spur one another within the church and also our neighbors, those we come in contact in while we're shopping and, and out and about, that we would spur one another 
with good deeds that we would love them. And irregardless, it's not about, hey, the, the Bible says this. I will tell you, a, a very smart pastor once told me, a million people will never remember anything that you had to say, but they will remember what you do. And so when it comes to what kind of legacy, what kind of legacy am I leaving? What kind of legacy are you leaving when it comes to your relationship with humanity? And, you know, and please um, uh, leave a, a, a good legacy uh, to your family, to your church, um, to your community, that when everything and happens and God calls us home eventually or he comes back and he raptures up his church, that people will say that we were a good person, even those who are not even a part of the church or even accepted Jesus, simply being a good person because we're encouraged by the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent us after his ascension. That's where our holiness comes from. Not anything that we do, it comes directly from God. God working through us and using us as willing vessels um, to be able to be used to help the world become a better place. And that draws people closer to Christ as we live as Christ would have us to live in this world. Again, neighbor, I pray that this message meets you well. I pray for you continually. There are special situations that we're constant phone calls that are going on. I thank you for the cards. I thank you for the letters of encouragement, emails, text messages. Thank you from the bottom of my heart that uh, you're reaching out in such a way. It, it really, and times of struggle during these last uh, several months and the days that are moving ahead, there are still difficult decisions that, that need to be made, but I, I appreciate you reaching out and encouraging me um, because there's not a time that a decision hasn't been made that I haven't been on my knees praying to God, asking for much wisdom and discernment and leading on the leadership of this church and sharing my heart with them and so that they understand where I'm coming from in a lot of different areas. The Fox Street Church of God was planted in the Grove and Franklin area to be a light in our communities, not just for the members within the walls that call this place home, but be a, a headquarters for good works to leave from those walls and to be a benefit to our neighbors. And I pray that that would be lived out more and more moving ahead. I love you guys. Take care of yourselves. And may you be incredibly blessed by Jesus this day. Take care now. Goodbye.